Oh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, peanut gallery. <laughs> Some of you will remember that, I suppose. When I uh, realized I was going to manage to get to this uh, conference by uh, um, adding it into a flight home from a business trip to San Diego, I contacted John Schusler and said, if you could stick me in for 5, 10, 15 minutes somewhere in a corner, uh, I'd be happy to talk about what I know about the uh, Mexican case. And now I find I've got two and a half hours. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I don't think it's going to last that long, but <clears throat> who knows. Anyway, some disclaimers to begin with. Uh, this has nothing to do with uh, my job working for the U.S. Navy. Um, sort of indirectly, I guess you could say, I'm working for the Department of Defense of, the, uh, of Mexico. Uh, when Jaime Mossan contacted me back in early May to ask me to look at that video, he said that um, uh, the uh, higher level Defense Department in Mexico was aware that I was being asked. And they did send me a copy of the, uh, a uh, complete copy of the video. And I have talked to a uh, uh, Air Force or Army Major, Major Soto, um, about this. And I'm hoping to get further information from the uh, Mexican Department of Defense. What you're about to hear is essentially a work in progress, because um, I haven't had uh, all the translation of the uh, tape. And there's uh, some experiments that I'll talk, talk to you a bit later that could be done to help elucidate the situation. Um, the PowerPoint presentation that I uh, am going to give, uh, you could get, I could make a CD copy for somebody if they want to order one uh, later. And um, what you're about to see is the latest version of the analysis. And this PowerPoint presentation is really up to date. It was completed this morning. I won't say what time in the morning. I might also put in a plug for something else. I have some con X conference. How many people know what the X conference was? A few people. That was back in, uh, I think, April or early May of this year in Washington, DC. I have some copies of my presentation there, if anybody would like that. <clears throat> anyway, what I'm going to do today is start off with a PowerPoint presentation here, go through some stuff, and then I'm going to read to you what the, the initial uh, story was. That, well, the first story about these sightings that was available in the United States was published on the Jeff Rents website. I suppose some of you at least are aware of that, www.rents.com. And I'm going to read to you what was posted, and then you can compare that with what the situation looks like now that there's been some analysis. And you'll see what happens when uh, uh, you compare quote, the truth, unquote, with what ends up in the press. Oh, might note my uh, email, my uh, website there, where I will be posting information as I get it. <clears throat> I'd also like to uh, begin by making a comparison with a previous sighting that I worked on 25 years ago. In the case in New Zealand, anybody here remember uh, the New Zealand sightings from December of 1978? In that situation, you had a civilian air crew and a news crew on board a uh, freighter aircraft flying off the coast of New Zealand. The air crew noticed some strange lights appearing and disappearing along the coast of the South Island of New Zealand, called up the uh, Air Traffic Control Center, which was monitoring their flight on ground radar, and they found there seemed to be some correlation between the lights they were seeing and the ground radar, and that sort of began a uh, uh, a bizarre sort of series of uh, incidents of unidentified lights being seen. Filmed, you have, um, in, this, in the Me Mexican case, you've got airplane radar. In the uh, New Zealand case, you've got ground and airplane radar. In the Mexican case, you have IR infrared video. Uh, and in the New Zealand case, color movie film. In the Mexican case, you had tape recording in the plane. In the um, New Zealand case, you had tape recording on the plane and at the air traffic control center. There were military witnesses doing a civilian and a civilian investigation as a situation going on in uh, the Mexican case. And here in the New Zealand case, 25 years ago, with civilian witnesses followed by a military investigation. 
and a civilian investigation because uh, uh, I investigated uh, the, military, the uh, New Zealand situation, but the New Zealand um, Air Force did their own on-the-spot investigation. In the case of New Zealand, the, the uh, New Zealand Air Force decided that it was uh, a squid fleet 100 miles off the coast of uh, New Zealand that uh, caused the sightings, and uh, even though many of the times the people were looking westward towards the New Zealand coast, and the squid fleet was eastward almost over the horizon. In both situations, you have news media that present an inaccurate version. And um, you had skeptics and scientists that proposed very speculative or simply incorrect explanations. Uh, in the New Zealand case, I wish I could present some of the, the newspapers at, that would show the, the initial explanations that were proposed. On the, the sightings occurred between midnight and 3 a.m. on December 31st, 1978. The, part of the, some of the witnesses were part of a news crew that was on board the aircraft, an, a, a, uh, a, a TV news crew, and as soon as they got off the aircraft, they immediately contacted their various uh, well, TV stations and uh, told about the sighting. So in the newspapers that morning, they already knew about the sighting, even before the general population had heard about it. In New Zealand, the, uh, uh, in Christchurch, New Zealand, um, the headline wrote, read that the UFO was Venus. Or the they had contacted an astronomer, and he said he was 99% sure that the UFO was Venus. Then, within 24 hours, the general population found out, oh, by the way, the sightings occurred half an hour to an hour before Venus was over the horizon. So the next day, the newspaper published a story saying, astronomer is now sure it was the planet Jupiter. Well, you have somewhat of a similar situation here when uh, Jaime Moussen got a hold of the videotape and then uh, announced its existence and the existence of the uh, sighting. And then the uh, uh, Mexican Air Force had a, or the Department of Defense had a press conference in which they made public this uh, uh, video. Um, explanations started coming out of the woodwork. People would come up with ideas based on a fraction of the data. And uh, it's always dis dismaying to find out uh, how quickly people are willing to uh, put their money on, uh, on something without knowing what it is. Anyway, here is a basic summary of the sighting. Uh, on March 5th, 2004, that should be, not 2005. Um, that's what happens when you do things at you know, X o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but maybe I'm thinking ahead, you know. <laughs> okay, between uh, 4.42 and 5.25, 5.28 uh, p.m. in the afternoon, sun was setting. They're over the northern Yucatan Peninsula. I'll show you a map. They're in a surveillance plane doing a routine area surveillance. Uh, apparently, uh, people uh, smuggling uh, running drugs and so on, typically cross the Yucatan Peninsula be, as they're flying from Colombia, I guess, north to uh, northern Mexico or the United States. And uh, they were flying northwest. They were southeast of a city called uh, Carmen City, Ciudad del Carmen, Carmen, and at an altitude of about two miles when they started getting some target, uh, first on the radar and then on this thing called FLIR, which is forward-looking infrared, uh, which I will tell you about. Here's a picture of the airplane. It's not a very, it's not a large aircraft. Two prop, two propellers. Right down here at the bottom, this black thing where I've got a, uh, an arrow right here. This is a uh, hemispherical and cylindrical and hemispherical device which holds inside it the optics and electronics for a forward-looking infrared system. And at the back of the airplane on the bottom is a radar dome. That is a hemisphere, but inside the hemisphere is this radar antenna that's continually rotating around. This shows the uh, track of the aircraft, this line. Actually, it was heading, if you can see this arrow that I'm moving here, it was going in a direction like this. 
made a turn to follow a radar target. Then they were running out of fuel up in this area, so they turned to the east and headed in that direction. It was during this time right here that they were tracking a radar target. Up at this point, they got their first indication of something on the FLIR that they couldn't understand. As they made this right turn, then they were looking with the FLIR back in this direction. And over here, they were looking roughly in this direction and getting bright lights on the uh, forward-looking infrared. Um, I call your attention to this, up in this area, this proximate area of, the, of an oil field, which may play a role in some of this. But when you see the video, what I'm going to do is go through this presentation that will give you an overview of the situation. Then I'm going to just run the video. You'll see the whole thing that I was given. And you have to be careful to, to, to note that Although the video runs continuously, there are time cuts in it. So somebody turned off the video, turned off the uh, video recording, waited for a period of time, and turned it back on again. This happened several times in the tape. So at 4:43 and 15 seconds, they detected a radar target, um, uh, which might have been—I don't know exactly because it's not recorded on the tape but it might have been uh, four to five miles in front of the aircraft. And uh, they followed this target. They catch up, caught up to it to a distance of about two miles and then followed it for several minutes as they were traveling along this path. The, what, what, well, the target was erratic in its speed, but traveled in basically a straight line ahead of the plane for about eight minutes. Its speed then increased as the plane turned towards the east to head home because it was running out of fuel. So here's a blow up of this uh, picture. The plane's traveling along here. They catch up about this range. They catch up at about this location. They, they catch up to the target to within about two miles, and from then on, they can't gain on it. It had started at a low speed and sped up. Since their radar was looking downwards, their natural assumption was that this was a plane that had taken off from a small airfield somewhere down below them uh, and was climbing up into their radar beam. That's how they de first detected it. This is their assumption at the time, I understand. And um, their big, the, the big thing that puzzled them was that they couldn't see it. So they had the radar, the FLIR system, and they thought, well, we will turn on the FLIR and see if we can find anything, any source of heat out there. Uh, now here's the radar display. This is just a picture taken out of the uh, uh, initial press documentary that was, uh, was released by Jaime Mosan. If you look at this, uh, you'll notice a center point here in rings that represent, I presume, 10 mile, 10 nautical mile segments. This shows what this radar was doing. Um, if you look at this picture right here, from the rear end, if you're looking at the back end of the aircraft or the front end, you'd see the beam at any instant as it's to the left or the right of the aircraft has a beam width in the vertical direction of eight degrees and a thickness in the horizontal direction as it's scanning around that's only two, two degrees. Every 10 seconds, this beam scans around the, uh, the bottom of the airplane. On the ground, it would make a uh, donut shape like that. The airplane is here. Here's the radar at the back end of the airplane. And then this uh, donut area. At the, this would have a certain width at ground level as a result of uh, the plane altitude. And if some object were to be at a higher altitude than the ground, it would, see a ra it would be within a radar beam that's even narrower than this width. What I don't know, now this is, this is the, I was told the radar is typically operated at 30 degrees down. What I don't know yet, but I have to find out, is whether or not the radar operator raised the beam angle, that has decreased this 30 degrees, so the beam was up here somewhere. It would make sense for him to do that because as this object was getting farther and farther away from, from him, he'd have to raise the beam in order to keep the object in the beam. But then you also have to understand that a radar beam is not a sharp-edged thing. When I talk about eight degrees of this vertical width, 
I'm talking about something like eight degrees of what are called the half power points. Um, any uh, optical or radio frequency type of beam going out has an intensity distribution pattern that's got a soft, a soft edge instead of a vertical edge like this and a flat, a top, a flat top pattern. You, instead of that, you get this curvature that always goes on. So eight degrees corresponds to half the power or half the radiation intensity. You do get some radiation intensity down here in the, what are called the wings of the uh, radiation pattern. So that even though an object might be, let's say, up in this area right here and seems to be out of the main part of the beam, there would be some radar energy going in this direction. So there's, the radar energy is spread out over a wide area, but most of it's concentrated right in there. That becomes important because of the fact that the guy tracked this to the edge of the, uh, uh, the, the limited capability of the radar in terms of distance. So anyway, the radar target is odd because it had erratic speed changes. It averaged, on average, it increases speed from about 85 miles an hour. Now, I'm talking about statute miles per hour here. So I've made a whole bunch of conversions from nautical miles to statute miles. A speed of about 85 miles an hour to a speed of the uh, airplane, the C-26 itself, which was going 230 approximately. So it's these, this object started off at 85 miles an hour. One if would assume that if it were a plane, that it was climbing upwards and gaining altitude and gaining speed at the same time, eventually hitting the speed of the uh, C-26 surveillance aircraft, 230 miles an hour, at which time it was about 2.2 2 .2 miles ahead of the, cra of the uh, C-26, and then it stayed there. The big thing that surprised the crew was they couldn't see anything. Now, if you're 2.2 miles, about two miles from an airplane, you ought to be able to see it. It's 10, 20, 30, 40 feet in size, depending on how big it is, you know, and they would be seeing it silhouetted against the ground. They would see it moving against the ground, looking down on it, as was their assumption. But no matter where they looked, and it was right in front of them, they couldn't see anything. So this is a radar-only type of uh, uh, sighting right at this point. So at 64, uh, 4, 4.42 p.m. in about 10 seconds, this target appeared in this continually sweeping beam. It was 30, 30 degrees down from horizontal, 8 degrees high, 2 degrees wide, at about 4 to 5 miles, and they assumed the target was below them. Then if you look at these um, times after that, 42 minutes, 43 minutes, 15 seconds, 30 seconds, and so on, as nearly as I can tell from uh, the translation we've got so far, 4.6 miles, 3.3, 2.4, 2.5. Um, and then the radar not only measures the distance to the target from the C-26, it also measures the position of the target on uh, two different sweeps, sweep one and sweep two, but this is done in succession, so it's uh, a sweep and the previous one. It looks at the target location in the previous sweep and the target location on the new sweep and takes the difference between these two. This gives you a distance that the target traveled and also a heading. So in some cases, the, uh, radar, the radar operator uh, stated what the heading was and the speed as determined by the radar system. You can see the speed increasing here, 75, 112. Then at this point, the radar operator couldn't be sure what the speed was. He corrected himself from 130 uh, miles an hour equivalent to 328. Uh, these, I said, again, are converted to statute miles. The nautical mile numbers were different. He, and it looked like the speed was fluctuating over a considerable speed range in the, uh, as a result of the radar. And we don't know whether this is an artifact of the radar or the actual object was uh, fluctuating in speed. But we do know that it managed to get ahead of the aircraft and stay there. Uh, 44 minutes, the speed was up to 223. And uh, I should point out that the only information we have on the radar targets that were detected is based on what the uh, radar operator stated, what, what he said at the time to the uh, airplane captain. Uh, they did have a radar, um, they did have a radar tape recorder, but it was not turned on. We do have the FLIR recording. And the FLIR system recorded the voices of what they were saying and also recorded what the uh, uh, infrared system saw. 
Okay, so still continuing through this situation. 44 minutes, 35 minutes, uh, or 44 minutes and 29 seconds, 35 seconds, 52 seconds, and so on. You can see the speeds going here, going up in speed, and then down in speed, and then up in speed, and headed directly towards, almost directly towards this town called uh, Carmen, which uh, again we'll look at. Um, the people on the aircraft, the uh, Air Force officers, checked to see if there was any scheduled aircraft to land in Carmen, and they were told that they were, there were no scheduled aircraft to land anywhere and they were the only aircraft in the sky, at least that's my understanding, that they were, they were flying alone as far as the ground was concerned. Okay, the, the um, let me go back here. All the radar activity for this first target was taking place as the plane, plane flew along here. And at this point, uh, all this time, they're also doing a search with the FLIR. When I run this tape, you'll see the, all sorts of land. They're looking downwards with the FLIR most of the time. You'll see landforms. You'll see these bright spots on the land. And then they tip the FLIR up, and you see clouds and so on. You'll see that uh, in, the, uh, in the video. And they were just basically searching ahead of them to find out if they could see this object that the radar was picking up. Then, as I said, just before they made this right turn to go back and head, get, uh, because they were running out of fuel, they did pick up something on the FLIR, which uh, attracted their attention. So what is this FLIR? Um, a device for searching for sources of heat, which in this case would be aircraft engines, and really the skin of the aircraft itself as it's flying along can get warm from the friction in the air. Uh, it's a uh, device operating at 3.5 to 5 micron radiation, which is known as uh, the mid-infrared region, eye, eyeballs run from 0.4 microns in the blue or, or violet uh, to about 0.7 microns. So this is, the spe this is the rainbow spectrum that we're talking that you would see if you looked at the light spread out into a rainbow by a prism. Blue would be 4 tenths of a micron maybe or maybe 0.45 microns. And um, red would be 0.65 to 0.7, red laser is in that range. Anything with a longer wavelength than that can't be seen, and near-infrared is, is, is infrared that is used um, by your uh, remote control for your TV or your VCR or something like that. It sends out a little infrared beam around eight-tenths of a micron. You can't see it. Your, see your video camera, however, can pick it up. How many people have ever tried shining their remote uh, control device into their uh, video camera? <laughs> it's an educational thing to do. <laughs> I remember one person I showed, I had taken a heat lamp, put it in a box, put it with a special type of glass that cuts out all the visible, so only, only infrared could come through. This creates, now when you turn it on, it creates an infrared beam that goes out of the box. You can actually feel it with your hands, but you can't see anything. Well, I brought this person into the room. It was completely dark. No, but you couldn't see anything. And I said, turn on your video camera and you'll be able to see. Turn on the video camera, and sure enough, the video camera was picking up that near-infrared radiation, and you could see everything in the room. Those of you who have a night shot type of video camera, as I have, uh, should be familiar with that. You can turn on this infrared beam and videotape people without them knowing. Well, that's 8 tenths of a micron or so. We're talking about an even longer wavelength, 3.5 to 4 to 5 micron range uh, is allowed into this system. Uh, so it picks up uh, hot objects. It also picks up surfaces. Um, and when you use this type of FLIR to look at an airplane at a distance, it looks like an airplane. It doesn't just look like a couple of hot spots where the engines are. You actually see the body of the aircraft. So they were expecting to see like the rear end of an aircraft. <clears throat> so they searched for about eight minutes, couldn't see it. Here's this a picture of the uh, typical uh, FLIR dome. You have this, uh, this has got several instruments on it, uh, forward looking infrared. One of these could be a visible TV camera, which they had. This particular dome has several aspects to it. Uh, I don't know exactly what they exactly what they had, uh, but they had at least an ordinary TV and the FLIR system. By the way, FLIR, forward-looking infrared, is a misnomer that uh, is a legacy of the original 
terms back in the 70s when they invented uh, or created these first forward-looking infrared systems that were really forward-looking. But nowadays, they're on a turret that allows you to look in any direction at all. So um, they should call it any direction IR, ADIR. So just before the plane turned to the right, the FLIR operator detected a very bright light. And then he turned off the FLIR recording as the plane turned. I don't know why he did that. It's uh, disappointing. We didn't get to see as much as we might have seen, but whatever. You'll see that effect anyway, where the light is a very bright light that he's looking at. And all of a sudden, you see clouds, and there's a time jump. The, uh, the, the uh, <clears throat> well, as I'll show later, the uh, presentation in the video gives you time every second. Now, one thing I discovered, which they didn't know at the time, was that as nearly as I can tell, the FLIR target was not in the same direction as the radar target before the turn. And after the turn, the operator found what could be the same FLIR target. We're not sure about that. He found it again. But once again, it wasn't aligned with the radar target. And by this time, the plane which had been heading northwest was now heading east. Here is what an image in this uh, forward-looking infrared video looks like. Uh, here is a bright target that they were looking at. Um, everywhere that is white is comparatively warm compared to, you know, compared to the background. And this FLIR system has automatic gain controls and so on to try to create the best picture depending on the uh, uh, temperature range of the scene you're looking at. And that can be uh, bothersome when you come to try to do some calibrations of the, uh, of the system. You know, how bright, this right here is sunlight reflected off a cloud. What is this? How much, how bright is this compared to that? It's hard to say. You both, they both create white images. At the bottom of this screen, you have the latitude, the longitude, the azimuth of the FLIR with respect to the aircraft, the elevation of the FLIR with respect to the uh, axis of the aircraft, the uh, fuselage axis. Um, that's this thing right here. Here's the azimuth. Here's the elevation. This is the date. And over here is the time with each second marked off. So we know second by second what the FLIR system is picking up. These are a couple of frames out of this first uh, section. Now, here I, I pointed out we were having the radar target traveling along here. And after the turn, they got a radar target, which was in this direction also. But the FLIR targets appear to have been in a different direction, unless the FLIR azimuth was, is way off, which I don't, can't be sure of. But it have, there's at least a 15 degree difference here. And um, if the plane were, twilt, were twisted, I'll tell you more about this. The, the azimuth of the FLIR, the actual azimuth with respect to the Earth, the azimuth of the FLIR with respect to the Earth is determined by the azimuth of the FLIR with respect to the airplane, plus any rat crabbing effect or twisting of the aircraft as it flies along. The airplane does not necessarily head in the exact direction that it's trying to go. If there's a crosswind, it'll have to head a little bit into the crosswind. So that means that uh, the, FLIR, the, the numbers that are read out of the FLIR system could be wrong with respect to Earth coordinates. Okay, so uh, 4.52, remember this started about 4.42, so this is about 10 minutes, 11 minutes afterwards. The FLIR finally fa uh, shows a single light, apparently moving to the right and passing behind clouds. The radar target that was heading northwest is now detected behind the plane. At the 7 o'clock position at 12 miles, course of 283 and speed 380 miles an hour, so it was now going faster than the C-26. But it was going west, and the C-26 was now going east. <clears throat> now, the tape was stopped for nearly two minutes as the plane turned. Um, well, after heading directly east for a couple of minutes, or a minute or so, the plane then made a slight turn to the left, and its heading was now 82 degrees. So if we go back to this, that's this point right, right here. It's heading almost exactly east along this part, and then it turned a little bit to the left, and was on a heading of 82 degrees azimuth. Azimuth is measured, here's north, and imagine an arc going down like that. Azimuth is measured as the rotation angle clockwise from north. That's azimuth with respect to the Earth. 
The azimuth number read out of the FLIR system is with respect to the forward direction of the aircraft. So for a period of time, about two minutes, the uh, FLIR system tracked a single light. This is the, you can see, when you see this happening, you'll see this little light um, moving along, apparently behind clouds occasionally, you know, and the uh, picture wobble, weaves back and forth because the camera, the, the guy operating the FLIR system is turning a knob or whatever to try to keep this uh, light in the field of view of the FLIR. The elevation uh, of the uh, FLIR, that is an implication of the direction, the elevation direction with respect to the aircraft, uh, to this light was a couple of degrees, which might mean the elevation was about zero in, with respect to the Earth. I'll tell you more about that later. It's one of the problems we run into with this uh, situation. <clears throat> there was a slow average increase in azimuth, which might be a result of a stationary light, which could be it was the, what they were picking up, a stationary light beyond the horizon, in which case it would be above the Earth, or closer if, if it was actually pacing the plane. Or it may be a coincident, coincidental result of the plane crabbing angle uh, increasing in a direction to the left, and I will tell you more about that. But this, what you're getting right now is the fine, and what might be considered the fine details of an investigation is going on. And if you don't understand some of what I say, um, I'll try to at least uh, summarize things at the end. 53 minutes, 16 hours, 53 minutes, 12 seconds. Uh, radar target was 7 o'clock, 12 miles, 384 miles an hour. A minute later, it was almost losing it off the screen. This is a target near this Carmen over here. Target moved that far away. Let's see here. Let me. Um, the crew criticized themselves for thinking that they should have been that they were looking downwards for a target when they should have been looking almost at their altitude. Uh, and this is where I wonder whether the guy tilted the radar up or not. That does play and it does have a have an effect on uh, what the con our concept or, or our estimate of the radar cross section for this airplane or whatever it was. The radar cross section is the amount of uh, radiation reflected back towards the radar system. <laughs> for a small radar cross section, you can't go, you can't detect it a long distance away. If you make a big radar cross section, you can detect it a very long distance. So anyway, um, the uh, radar operator said that it was at this six, 55 minutes past the hour, 55 minutes and 50 seconds, I think. Now, I'm guessing that it was at 7 o'clock, 31.8 miles away. Then uh, a few seconds later, it was one or two miles uh, from Carmen, the city. And the FLIR target was at 7.30. Now, these numbers are, are o'clock numbers. You have to imagine a clock. 12 o'clock is straight ahead. 3 o'clock is to the right. 9 o'clock is to the left. 6 o'clock is behind. Any intermediate number, 1, 2, and 3, for example, would be 30, 60, and 90 degrees with respect to um, straight ahead. So they're always they're talking about uh, um, directions in terms of the... Uh, a clock face. So when I say the radar targets are at 7 o'clock and the FLIR targets are at 7.30, that's about a 15 degree difference. Here again is this picture showing from this point right here, a FLIR target in this direction at uh, 7 o'clock and the uh, radar at 7.30 going over here to this place called Carmen, which is about 40 miles away. <coughs> Then it was one or two miles from Carmen. Then it wasn't on the screen, but he said the radar is still showing it at 37. I have to find out if that means that there's a persistence in the radar that shows the last position of a target. I don't know exactly what that means. Carmen City was 48 miles away at this point. Then he says it's now over Carmen. And somebody made a comment, wow, the radar is doing a good job. <laughs> I guess because it's picking this thing up at the limit of its range. Then he says a little later, OK, I just lost it. Then he says it's passing by Carmen. It seems to be turning to the right. I don't know what's going on here. We don't have the radar tape. Um, and once we get perfect translation, maybe we will learn more from, uh, about the radar target, what it was doing. 
and exactly how it disappeared, but I guess it faded out. And it got to the point where the radar couldn't, uh, couldn't pick it up anymore. It was beyond the range of the radar. So here's the first appearance. Now, I pointed out that they made the right-hand turn. They picked up a target, a FLIR target. that they were, It was a single light, and they followed this for a long period of time. I should also mention, by the way, when you look carefully at the video, you can see that there's not only a single somewhat dim light that they were following, but it was preceded, apparently, on the right-hand side by a much brighter light that the FLIR operator, for some reason or other, didn't notice when he was searching the clouds to find this radar target, and suddenly this little, red, little light pops out of the, uh, appears to pop out of a cloud. Um, he narrows in on it and ignores the, the bright one. But then he loses this single target behind a cloud, does some more searching of the clouds, and suddenly he, he, he also changes his field of view. Field of view is another term that you're going to see note over here, see many times. Field of view is how wide an angle are you looking at when you look at, your, when you look at the screen. When you uh, use a telescope to bring things up close, you're narrowing your field of view. And he had three fields of view he could worry about, he could use here. A medium field of view, narrow field of view, and a super narrow field of view. And these are all Pre, you can't see the, the uh, presentation along the top right up here, but the field of view he was using is listed by the FLIR up at the top. And here is the wide field of view. And now notice these two bright things right here, like car headlights pointing right at you. Here's a uh, uh, sort of a blow up of this picture. There's a light at this point, which is very faint but stays at a fixed distance, more or less, from these. As you see this on the screen, when you watch this on the screen, you're going to see these clouds moving to the left. And of course, this whole picture wobbles back and forth, but in general, the clouds are moving to the left. It appears that these things are moving to the right. Two very bright lights, which I call the twins, then a bunch of followers, one right here, and a series of lights in this area. I tried to do distance estimates uh, to the clouds by um, uh, parallax or, or triangulation, where at one point, you assume the airplane's traveling along in a straight line. This gives you a straight baseline for a triangle. You look at the azimuth to a fixed location from the first position of the airplane, and the azimuth from an, uh, to the same fixed location on, the next, on another location along the path of the airplane, you get this triangle. And you can sort of calculate how far away, um, if you know how far the plane traveled between uh, positions that you measure the azimuth, then you can make uh, distance estimates. And I say estimates because it's kind of hard to uh, be sure exactly of a fixed point on a, on a cloud. But I, tried to, I picked points that seemed to be uh, reasonably characteristic that I could follow. You'll see, you know, when you see the FLIR video, you'll see that it, the fact that you're flying past these clouds means you changed your perspective view of them. Anyway, 16 miles here, 12 miles here. That just gives you an idea of, uh, of distances. When we actually got some situations where these things went behind clouds and I was able to indicate uh, estimate a distance to the cloud, then that set a minimum distance to the object. One of the uh, most intriguing uh, aspects of the video were these extremely bright lights that were picked up, completely saturating the, um, the video capability. This is an inverted picture where white is, uh, white is now converted to black. We don't know what these ghost images are. We don't know what these things are. There was also a halo effect that doesn't show up too well in this uh, illustration, but you'll see it in the video. These things were so bright that they were causing reflections inside the optics that even surprised the FLIR engineers. Uh, I should mention, by the way, that um, I have been in contact with the engineers at the corporation that made the FLIR system and also the people who made the uh, radar system. Uh, image size versus brightness. This, uh, effect, this is an effect that you would see with your eyeball, with any video camera, any photograph, photographic camera, any system that forms an image. If you take a, a tiny bright light a long distance away, uh, if it's not too bright, it will make an image of some size. Here's the apparent width of the image for moderate exposure, or low exposure here, actually. A lower dim light curve. This is a 
the power distribution of the light. Similar to the radar distribution that I talked about before, you don't have the image of a, uh, even if the bright source has a fixed, very sharp edge to it, the image does not have a fixed, very sharp edge. A sharp edge would be a vertical line here and a vertical line here. Instead, you get this distribution of light. Here's a noise level for any system, whether it's uh, photographic noise or electronic noise in a uh, thing like a FLIR system. You get a, a, a width like that. If the light gets brighter, at the same level of brightness, you get a wider image. And when the light gets really, really bright, you get even wider. And maybe the top of the, light, the image is converted to a flat. See, what happens here is this, is this is black, let's say, on the FLIR imagery. This is black. This is the maximum white that you can get. Any image is going to fall somewhere in this range. And if you get images that are saturated like this, they could have power levels going way up, but you wouldn't know it. It could be a power level that's just up above this range, or it could be something going way up here. This is a vertical line, represents the, uh, the brightness. This is the position along the image. And as I said, this is a curve that represents how the brightness changes with respect to position in, within the image. In this situation, we, are, we have images that range from extremely oversaturated to just barely above the noise level. So here we have, again, this picture. Uh, you can see the, how bright this is, big and bright, and then how faint some of these little things here are. Uh, here is a situation where there's a plane flies along. These lights appear to go behind a cloud. And I tried to uh, look at this cloud edge over a period of time as the lights went behind it and then calculate the distance to it. Uh, this is on the narrow field of view. Here, this shows you the uh, numbers at the top, uh, giving you the, up here it says it's white, and this says NRW for narrow, and this is an inertial reference point and a few other things. This is daytime video. Um, a tenth of a degree between these lights. Uh, a tenth of a degree is uh, 1.7 milliradians, for those of you who know what milliradians are. You simply multiply the number of milliradians by the distance, and that gives you what would be equivalent separation. If they were 1,000 feet away, it would be 170 feet. I'm sorry, 1.7 feet. Uh, I should point out that this whole distance from, from here to here was 2.1 degrees which is a few miles of distance if it were like 25 miles away. Here is a frame from the video showing some of these lights appearing to come out of a cloud. Actually, I, I've decided this area here is not a cloud. This is a hole looking through into the infinite atmosphere of the Earth, like over here. And so they, they came from behind a cloud, and then they go into some other clouds. You'll see this happening in real time in the video as they move along. And they, they seem to be coming out, of, out from behind the clouds, going through a clear space, and then behind the clouds again. Uh, estimated distance, 25 miles. Now, this very black is a cloud. This is, this is black because this is at the temperature of the surroundings. It's not directly illuminated by the sun. Here on the white, you've got solar illumination on a cloud. So this is sunlight reflecting from the, what if you could call a cloud having a surface. This is sunlight reflecting from the surface of the cloud. This black spot right next to it is a place that's shaded from the sun. It's 25 degrees or something below zero, below zero centigrade up here in this upper atmosphere. So the water vapor by itself is cold. And if there were no sun, it would all be black. It only looks white because you're getting reflected sunlight. As for these targets or objects themselves, whatever they are, they're either generating heat, they're either hot objects themselves, or they are reflecting the sun. You will see at the very beginning, of, uh, well, not the very beginning, but you will see on this um, video that they pick up bright spots on the Earth. And they are bright spots caused by reflection from the sun. Um, here's another uh, frame from the video showing these two bright objects. One, this, this is dim here because it just went past a little piece of a cloud right there. 
They both went, apparently went, seemed to go right past this cloud. So the point is that they're behind this cloud, okay? And if you try to estimate the distance of this cloud uh, feature um, some 25 miles away, and if these objects actually were moving at a distance of 25 miles an hour, if they were only 25 miles away, then they were moving at a speed of about 100 miles an hour. But if they were farther away, they could be moving at a lower speed. This is a, one person is called a triangle paradox, but if you don't know how far away the thing is, you can look at the change in azimuth. As the plane flies along, you can look, in the cha look at the change in azimuth to a radar or an object out there um, as being a result of the object being stationary with respect to the Earth and a long distance away, or if it's closer than that, it has to be traveling in parallel somewhat with the aircraft. Well, you saw the structure up here, the, or, the, the arrangement of there was a uh, radar uh, FLIR object here, and then two bright ones there, and then one here, and a bunch of stuff there. And that's at, um, oh, seven, five, five, three minutes after five. Then as time goes on, here we are seven minutes after, six minutes after, seven minutes after five. Something has happened. They went behind the clouds. I mean, or the clouds went be in front of them, however you want to look at it. And something changed with the arrangement. We assume that these are the same lights, but maybe that's a bad assumption. Now you get a bunch of lights which are, have this arrangement. Instead of the twins, you've got triplets. And one triplet actually split in two, reunited, and then split in two again as the time went on. Again, you see that you can watch this. It's like, it's, 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 there's so many details happening on these video, you know, you really have to watch it several times. That's why I'm going through it first to alert you to, to things to watch for. In this first triplet, you can watch for this light right here, separating into two and then joining back again and separating into two. It's all the time the clouds are going in front of, uh, so you have to watch when these things are between clouds. Now one guy who, uh, Th Thomas Strunch in Denmark, I might mention, by the way, that this is an international investigation. Uh, I've sent material and received material from people in Denmark, France, Brazil, United States, uh, various other places, uh, Mexico, of course. Anyway, one guy took the time to try to get these arrangements correct. And this is these heat sources. After the twins have gone, whatever, it's changed into the double triplets and so on. Um, you get this sort of an arrangement and later on this. And here's this thing that was double and goes back to one and then splits up again. So this plays a role in things like, was it the oil field flares? Because the oil field flyers can't change their position in a couple of minutes, at least not by the amount that uh, <laughs> is indicated here. So anyway, the leader, the twins and the followers somehow turned into the leader, the double triplets and numerous followers totaling 17 or more lights, I say 17 or more because some people have counted up to 24. Um, during the flight itself, you can hear the uh, FLIR operator counting the lights and he gets up to Onse, 11. 11 lights and so he thought that there were 11 UFOs flying along beside the aircraft. Uh, during this time, the, uh, the azimuth increased non-uniformly from 132.7 to 138 and a half degrees. The plane traveled 13 and a half miles, so that leads to a crude estimate, and I'll show you what I'm doing later, a crude estimate of a distance of 133 miles. No radar target was picked up during this period of time when there were a lot of lights on the FLIR. Now, one possible th explanation for that is, according to what is said on the radar, or said on the, radar, uh, said on the uh, audio tape, is that the radar was blind for about 20 degrees between 8 and 9 o'clock. So possibly they didn't detect these because the radar couldn't see there. Um, I don't know. Anyway, after the big twins had departed, a small, there were, well, this was, after all this big collection of lights, the 11 or, four, or, 11 or 17 or 24 lights had gone, then there starts, on the, 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 the uh, video is turned off, 
and then turned on again. Here's this time gap. And uh, this time they showed a very bright one with a couple of dim lights near it. That doesn't, that doesn't show the dim lights here, but there's a very bright one you'll see on the video. And to the left, a, a pair of lights up here that might be called the dim twins and a very bright follower or friend. So what's been happening with the radar? The radar didn't have a target all the time. The FLIR was picking up a whole bunch of lights. But then the radar got a target at 1 o'clock while the FLIR was getting lights at 9 o'clock. Another set of lights that appeared, or a light that appeared at just to the uh, left of the aircraft, 90 degrees out to the left at 9 o'clock, while there's a radar target at 1 o'clock, which is 30 degrees to the right of straight ahead. It was at this point that the people were st starting to get worried because they had on the FLIR, they had had on the FLIR something on the right-hand side. Now they got a radar target in front. Previously, they had a radar target. The last time they saw the first radar target, it was behind them. So you get statements on the uh, video like, we've got them in front, in the middle, and at 8 o'clock, fasten your seat belts, don't scare me. Are we surrounded? This is your lucky day. <laughs> Radar target uh, was at 22 miles, speed 60. Then a bit later, I don't know because uh, the translations haven't been matched up with times exactly. Radar target is 19 and a half miles, speed 60, heading, 90, heading 95 degrees. At this point, the light at the left was momentarily blocked by a cloud top over 10 miles away. So once again, we know whatever was out there was a long distance. Um, then the radar target distance decreased to 17 miles. Uh, uh, FLIR light went behind a cloud at 14 miles. Then target at, uh, radar target as ahead of the aircraft or at 1 o'clock at 11 miles, 10 miles. Speed was 60 miles an hour, notice, and stayed that way. Then the FLIR picked up the moon, which was very convenient. They turned the FLIR over into, into the uh, 1 o'clock direction to see if they could see anything and didn't. But they did pick up the moon, which is very convenient because that helped calibrate the FLIR. Um, 20 minute, 21 minutes after the hour, the radar target was nearly at 3 o'clock now, still speed 60 with, its, with a heading that was uh, in the, towards the southeast. Then the last reading on this radar target um, was at uh, 8.2 miles, and it, it was heading almost due south at that point. And you hear a statement that says, uh, it was pulling away now. Who knows what it was? Then there was another time gap. Then the FLIR shows another bright, irregularly shaped image with a featureless dark background at an azimuth of 175. So this radar, this FLIR image is now behind the aircraft. And we have a statement, the radar target that was at 1 o'clock just exited the radar field. Um, I guess what he's saying is the airplane had flown past it. Then the FLIR is showing some uh, bright light and some very dim images. And then you have the end of the uh, uh, video. The FLIR image shrinks in size. The radar target disappears. And somebody says, how weird is all this? And I'm reminded of a um, poem, I think, by T.S. Eliot that ends with, this is how the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. <laughs> so we've had a very exciting event happen in this, as far as the people on this plane is concerned. And uh, it certainly, you can tell by the reactions of the people on the plane that they were startled by what happened. Nothing like this had ever happened to them before. And so this uh, fed into the uh, uh, way it was presented. Let's see. I'm going to read what was the first press release on this sighting. And I'll show the video, and you can make up your mind. And uh, well, from the follow-on discussion, you'll be able to tell um, where things have changed compared to what they thought it was originally. Anyway, this is an exclusive Mexican DoD acknowledges UFOs in Mexico by Santiago Aturia, uh, published May May 11, 2004. The UFO phenomenon in Mexico has been recognized as a fact. In an, in a historic and unprecedented decision taken by the Mexican Department of Defense under his under the Secretary of Defense, General Clemente Vega Garcia, commander of all armed forces in this country. So basically, the release of the video was under the, uh, over the signature of the Secretary of Defense. The unique uh, incident that will change history here in Mexico was the result of a high-level incident with a 
Mexican Air Force airplane, military pilots and personnel that were involved in a situation with several UFOs while doing a routine surveillance anti-narcotics operation to detect a drug smuggling flight. The news was released last night, Sunday, May 9th, by Jaime Mossan, researcher and TV journalist, during the TV show Los Grandes Misterios del Tercer, Tercer Milenio, I hope you'll forgive my Spanish, Great Mysteries of the Third Millennium, broadcast by a Mexican TV network uh, in the city of Monterey, uh, NL. I'm not sure what that stands for. Hmm? Nuevo León? Was that what? Jaime Massan announced that on Tuesday, May 11th, there will be an international press conference to present the case and the investigation made by the Department of Defense, along with Massan's research team, in an, in an unprecedented collaboration. The press conference will take place at a hotel in Mexico City, uh, and all international media representatives have been invited. Um, it will be broadcast on national television. All the facts and materials of the investigation will be presented at the conference, including the official footage by the Air Force, as well as interviews with the pilots and personnel involved in the amazing incident. The facts. On April 20th, 2004, Jaime Mossan was contacted by a high officer. I might point out how many people here are familiar with Jaime Mossan. He is a TV journalist in Mexico, Mexico City, who has been following the UFO subject for a number of years, I guess he really got turned on back in 1991. Some of you may remember there was a, a flap of sightings during a uh, solar eclipse that uh, occurred over Mexico back at that time. And, was, and since then, there have been a number of uh, videos and sightings and so on. And Mosan has been uh, at the forefront of promoting the subject. Anyway, he was contacted by a high officer of the Department of Defense to have a private meeting and discuss a subject of high relevant matter. The next day, Mossan met General Clemente Vargas Vega Garcia, Secretary of Defense, and his major staff, and was informed about an incident that took place on March 5, 2004, in the airspace of Ciudad del Carmen, in a state of Campeche, where an Air Force Merlin C-26 bimotor airplane was doing a routine flight to detect a smuggling drug airplane during an anti-narcotics operation. So basically, they were just flying around looking to see if they could find something. The airplane was equipped with a high-tech advanced digital equipment to register and record all the activities during the operation. Powerful sensors like a FLIR, FLIR is the name of the corporation, FLIR Systems Corporation in uh, Portland, Oregon, that sold this device called the Star Sapphire II. And there was also a radar called ANPS-143BV3, so the, the FLIR system and the radar system. They were being used by qualified personnel aboard the airplane, and all the operation was being recorded both in the normal and infrared mode. The airplane was under the command of Mayor Magdaleno Hasso Nunez. The FLIR operator was Lieutenant Mario Adrian Vas Vasquez, and the radar operator was Lieutenant German Ramirez, all of them members of the 501st Aerial Squadron. This airplane is programmed only for surveillance and detection procedures, not for interception or combat maneuvers. Their duty is to detect and identify drug dealers' flights and then immediately report them to the base where combat planes are scrambled to intercept those narcotic smugglers. So now begins the details of the uh, flight. At approximately 5 p.m., the Merlin C-26 detected an unknown traffic. It says at 10,500 feet. The airplane was flying at 10,500 feet. But the, what, what is written here is detected an unknown traffic at 10,500 feet over Ciudad del Carmen. So the implication of this is that the object itself was over the city at 10,500 feet. Detected an unknown traffic at 10,500 feet over Ciudad del Carmen, Compeche airspace, and according to the protocol on suspecting a drug dealer airplane, Major Hasso made a maneuver to approach the unidentified uh, traffic. At a, certain, at a certain range to get a close look and record the target with their equipment. At the same time, Major, uh, Major Hasso reported by radio to the base that a possible suspect was detected requesting the interceptor planes to be in an alert condition. Now, I don't know whether that's possible to get off this radar tape or not, uh, exactly what happened. But anyway, they say here that he is requesting interceptor planes to be in an alert condition. The radar was detecting unknown traffic and the FLIR system was recording the object in infrared. Notice what I said, I'll write it again. The FLIR system 
the, the uh, radar was detecting an unknown traffic and the FLIR system was recording an object in infrared. As the airplane tried to approach the unknown traffic to make a visual identification, it suddenly, in a surprising maneuver, escaped, flying away at a tremendous speed. By this time, Mayor Husso tried to pursue, par pursue the target, but it was very fast. All this was being recorded by the FLIR and also the radio conversations with the base describing the unexpected maneuver of the unknown. However, the C-26 crew still had not made visual contact with the unknown object. Just some moments passed when suddenly the unknown object returned and began following the C-26 in a surprising situation. This was detected by the radar and the FLIR while the personnel on board were trying to make visual contact of the unidentified traffic now following them. In seconds, the equipment detected now not only one but two traffics or two objects following them. The images in both radar and FLIR were clear and unmistakable, but both pilot and personnel still couldn't have visual contact with these two objects following them, adding a great surprise to this disconcerting situation. Major Hassel reported to the base the uh, unique incident that was taking place, giving detail of all the information registered by the equipment while, keeping, while tr trying to make visual contact of the unknowns. The FLIR kept recording in infrared every, every movement made by the two unknown objects that seemed to be keeping their distance from the C-26 but still following it. The personnel aboard the C-26 were confused and seeing images uh, on the FLIR and the radar and asking themselves what was going on in this situation. Okay, here's a, another paragraph uh, headline that says, the incident turns more dramatic. But the stressing moment that the C-26 crew were passing through was just the beginning of something more dramatic that will turn their undesirable experience into a real nightmare. Some minutes passed while the Mexican Air Force C-26 crew continued making maneuvers to have a visual contact of the unknowns despite, because despite both radar and FLIR that were showing perfectly clear uh, both unidentified objects for unexplained reasons, there was not a visual contact, uh, even though the objects were at close range. It was during this round and round maneuvers to identify these two objects that something amazing happened. In a matter of seconds, more unknown objects arrived on the scene and uh, the disconcert of the crew was total. The radar and the FLIR detected immediately the presence of nine new objects of the same size and characteristics, unknown objects that arrived to the scene surprisingly like coming from nowhere. Now the situation has entered into a high level of danger. So Major Hassel reported by radio to the base the new situation requesting instructions. But the most unique thing was that even though there were 11 unknown objects close to them, still the crew couldn't see them. No visual contact with the unknowns was possible for some reason, never, experienced, never before experienced by these highly trained men. However, the high-tech sophisticated equipment and the sensors were not lying. There were 11 targets outside them with unpredictable intentions. At the middle of a complete, uh, well, in, in complete confusion among, uh, among the uh, C-26 crew, the unknown object suddenly made a maneuver surrounding the Mexican Air Force airplane in a circle at close range. The radar and the FLIR presented a unique image of 11 objects nearby in a circle formation around the Merlin C-26A. That would be scary. The situation was out of control. Major Hasso reported to the base that the C-26 situation was now in red alert, surrounded by 11 mysterious round-shaped objects camouflaged with a certain unknown advanced technology that avoided any visual contact. However, Major Hasso kept the calm as well as the crew, who kept himself calm as well as the crew who were working fast, measuring and recording every detail of this unique incident, conscientious of their duty as military and trained men. Confronting this situa situation surrounded by unidentified objects in an unpredictable ending, Major Hasso took the decision of turning out all the airplane lights to see what would happen. Moments of high suspense lived by the crew, were lived by the crew while the FLIR was recording images of those bright objects even though visual contact was not possible. There were moments of silence and uncertainty. The C-26 crew kept calm doing their duty, documenting every moment of the strange incident while Major Hasso continued in contact with the base. After some stressing minutes, the 11 objects disappeared, giving an end to the strange experience that these members of the 501 Aerial Squadron just lived. The Merlin C-26 returned safe to the Air Force Base, and Major Hasso prepared a complete report of the incident along with the C-26 crew. The Secretary of Defense took note of Major Hasso's report and began a full investigation 
studying and evaluating every element of the case, statements of the crew, images, lectures, measurements of all the equipment, as well as a complete evaluation of the meteorological data were undertaken. The incident was given, taken very seriously by the Department of Defense staff, and after several weeks of investigation, they decided, under command of General Clemente Vega Garcia, to contact researcher and TV journalist Jaime Mossan for a special collaboration in this investigation as an experienced researcher in these matters. So Jaime Mossan was well known to them as an investigator of strange things. On April 22, 2004, General Vega, Secretary of Defense, gave Jaime Mossan a copy of all the tapes and data collected by the Merlin C-26 during the incident for study, evaluation, and analysis by Mossan's research team. As a compliment, uh, to complement this investigation, and as an external collaborating source trying to establish a definition of the possible motives and consequences of the March 5th incident. General Vega, as well as his staff, were very open to discuss the subject and showed their legitimate interest in conducting this investigation in order to establish the truth of what happened. General Vega authorized the C-26 crew to give Jaime Mossan the interviews needed without any censorship, giving all the facilities to, the, to present this case to the Mexican people, an historic and unprecedented decision that will open a new era of mutual co collaboration among Mexican ufologists and the military forces, a collaboration based in respect and interest to find the truth of the intense UFO activity we've been experiencing here in Mexico since the beginning of the amazing Mexican UFO wave back in July 11, 1991, which was the uh, uh, solar eclipse I mentioned. The new era of relationship between Mexican UFO witnesses, sky watchers, ufologists, and our military forces will try to establish and give form to a new legislation in our law system focused to be prepared for any incident involving these unidentified flying objects, our people, our commercial and military airplanes, and so on, for learning and understanding what we are going to do and how we are going to confront this reality. End of the release. So we can congratulate the uh, Mexican Air Force on taking an open attitude towards this subject. Apparently they did their own investigation, concluded that they couldn't explain it. When they held their press conference, they listed a number of things that they believe it could not be, including balloons, aircraft, and, uh, and ball lightning, and so on. And um, they have turned over this video to the general public. It is non-copyrightable. Anybody can uh, do whatever they want with it. And so now I'm going to show this video, and I will be making some comments as time goes on, if, assuming that this microphone will be on at the same time the video is playing, but they will, you will hear people talking in the background. Uh, unless you speak very fluent Spanish, it probably won't, uh, you won't be able to understand it because even, even people who have, who are, you know, native Spanish speakers have a trouble because, trouble understanding because this is specialized jargon being used by the crew and verbal shorthand and so on. So if I could have the video run. Now, the very beginning of this, you see ordinary TV imagery of yeah, ordinary TV imagery of the ground that they are flying over. This will give you a, orient you to the type of ground they're going over. Entre 10 y 15 millas de la Laguna Miramar. No sé si podemos continuar directo para tenerla a la vertical y ver, sacar la coordenada de la que tengo en la... ¿Qué rumbo? A las 12. ¿Será? ¿Seguimos el rumbo? Afirmativo. Sí. Ok. Nos dices cuando esté sobre la, sobre la pista. Ajá. You might notice that it doesn't, it's not perfectly focused. The little X's and dots move around in a random fashion are electronically generated little spots that pick up what the electronics think might momentarily be interesting features. If they lock into a very bright light, you'll see an X mark onto that light. This right now is normal TV.
Normal TV lasts five or six or seven Nos minutes. Queda aquí, nos quedó del lado izquierdo, ¿no? The IRR. Ah, demasiado a, a la... That's it. Ah, no, por la derecha. If you glance at the lower right, you can see what time it is. There's three digit, three pairs of digits at the lower right hand tie. That's the time in 24 hour clock notation. The little dots, as I said, are electronically generated cursor marks. That, that the, the electronics picks up what it thinks might be interesting features and puts a dot there. Right now, there aren't any interesting features, so they just sort of randomly move around. Certainly looks like they're, they're taking pictures of an airstrip cut out of the woods down there. Now they begins the, uh, the clear search for the radar target. There's a town that was uh, they're flying near, and there's a river that runs near that town. You see bright spots on on the ground at ground level, which are either sources of heat or else they're reflections of sunlight. Okay, la veo. La pista está aquí a la una. ¿Dónde sí. anda? Sí. Eh, a las doce de nuestra posición, el grado 2.3. No, pero la pista ya está a la derecha. ¿Ya la vio? 
Ahora el radar me está marcando 2.14, oiga. 2.97, corrijo, 97 de velocidad. 97 de velocidad. Sí. Redúcele. ¿Qué carta es Juárez para buscarla? La, la de... está este... de los cinco. Síguele dándome datos. Ok. Coste dos punto en millas. Lleva rumbo 298 y 113 de velocidad. ¿Y hermosa? 113. Sí, está este... Ahora el radar me está oscilando entre 285 y 213. Y 113. ¿De qué de velocidad? Sí. ¿Cuánto? Sí, eh... Ahora 124 y 2.15 era. Ya tienes el regular teléfono para llamar a headquarters. Notice that most of the time the FLIR is pointed down to the ground. They're assuming that they're detecting on the radar some object that's coming up from the ground, an ordinary airplane. Spend very little time looking at, a, at looking in the sky at their altitude. Well, that's looking approximately. Uh, it's still looking somewhat downwards. There's those two lights on the ground. That's normal. That was a very brief switch to a normal video, which didn't show anything either. This is an edge of the uh, landform you saw there, water up above and uh, land down below, and some bright thing on the land. Me está marcando eh, 206 de velocidad y lleva un rumbo 301. Capitán Tellez. Tellez con el coronel Wilson. Este, no sé ahorita como antes decía, este, eh, nada más ahorita se encuentra el jefe de ceniceros o en su resuelto lo puedo atender yo jefe. Ok, nada más para informarte que aproximadamente sobre Tenosic, eh, no, al, al Néctar Eco de Tenosique hubo un contacto radar con una aeronave que no hemos podido localizar, todavía está en contacto radar con el equipo del avión. Estamos tratando de encontrarlo visualmente, pero like up it like this when you see landforms off in the distance, he's looking in the direction where the oil fields are. I'm not seeing any oil fires. Radar. A ver, radar, dame información del avión. Proposición a 2.1 millas eh, con 166 de velocidad. Corrijo ahora 207 y con rumbo 302. That's the bottom of the aircraft. Okay. Now he's looking at a reflection okay. of the sun and the bright spots are reflections of the sun in the little lakes down there. Okay, chequenme, Ciudad del Carmen. Eh, un aterrizaje de alguna aeronave ahora próximamente. Eh, ¿Iba por la ciudad de Carmen? Aparentemente es el rumbo que tiene, pero nosotros la detectamos eh, haciendo maniobras de poca velocidad, de poca velocidad. No la pudimos ver visualmente, pero el radar la tiene en contacto. Radar va hacia Ciudad del Carmen aparentemente cambió. All this time, they're, they're two miles approximately behind a radar target. Okay, jefe, entonces, este, déjame checar esta con Ciudad del Carmen y también doy parte de esta jefe de servicio. Enterado. Para, para a a el eh, estamos en el límite. Sí, o sea, sí límite con seguridad. Así es. Ok. Dale pues. ¿Qué hacemos? ¿Dónde va la tarjeta? ¿Cuántas millas adelante? 2.1.
phone back on the hook. <laughs> Now this this landform I'm trying to have identified, I think it's in the direction of uh, Carmen City. ¿Dónde está todavía? ¿Tú todavía no lo puedes ver? No parece. ¿Todavía está enfrente? Sí, lo tengo enfrente, oiga. That landform right there in the center. I think it's directly towards uh, Carmen City right there. It would be on the left-hand end of that. Let's get in Now he's got something. This is the uh, first unidentified right here. Then the plane goes into a turn. He turns the camera off. Now he's trying to reacquire that target, but the camera's been off for a minute or two. So he's looking at the cloud that that target was near. And you'll see on the right-hand side, you can see a little light moving out. And if you look to the very right of the screen, for momentarily you'll see a very bright one at the upper right-hand corner. You see a very bright one and then a dim one. Now the one that he's following is dim. There's a bright one ahead of it. Now, this is the first thing that he follows for a long period of time. And I have tried to, uh, as you'll see, tried to analyze the uh, azimuth variation over this couple of minutes and uh, find out the distance that that might be if it were a stationary target on the Earth. If you see down there on the lower right hand side, you see 90 degrees. You see a scale that says minus 180, minus 90, zero, 90, and 180. Ignore the scale except for the fact that uh, it gives you a marker. From the plus 90 degrees, look straight down and you see two degrees elevation. Below the zero, you see minus 132.9 degrees azimuth. So that's where your azimuth and elevation readings are worth trying to keep track of. The elevation should be above zero if you're going to have something that's up in the sky. The azimuth at a minus 135 degrees azimuth is uh, uh, 45 degrees to the left of directly behind the aircraft. 135 azimuth is behind him to the left. Now, at this point, the radar target is behind them and moving away. If you examine this little light frame by frame, you see that it's fluctuating in brightness, just as you can see, it's very rapid, uh, twinkling sort of thing. Uh, there's no features to that, it's just sort of a roundish dot. Uh, it is hot compared to the black, dark background. Uh, it doesn't seem to be quite as hot as the, uh, or have quite as much radiation as the light reflected from the clouds. See some black spots on the TV screen that remain fixed with respect to the grid marks. Those could be uh, bad pixels, individual elements of the CCD array that don't work anymore. This is the medium field of view. We're looking at the narrow field of view. This is medium. Things seem to move uh, relatively more slowly because they're covering larger angles. Now watch this light go behind the cloud. That place where it went behind the cloud, I tried to uh, triangulate and get a distance to. Now here's the first appearance of what I call the twins. If you look to the right of the twins, there's a very faint light moving. 
appears to be moving. Then to the left of the twins, there were other lights. You see the halo around this indicating extreme brightness. The clear engineer doesn't know what would make, uh, if there's, doesn't believe there's any optical thing that, effect that would make the lower the lights that were sound down, down below the uh, main bright lights. Now watch the other lights. And a bunch more coming. A whole bunch of them. And that's not the end of it yet. <laughs> Here come the laggards. <laughs> Now, notice that by, as time goes on, the, the actual edge of that cloud changed somewhat, but I attempted to measure, make a measurement of the distance to that edge. I forget what it was, 15 miles or so. Here's the, uh, what appears to be a dark cloud hook, a very black um, uh, area, and I, this is again where I attempted to make measurements of the distance to the clouds. The objects are now behind some clouds. They were momentarily visible. Now on the right-hand side, or the middle approximately, if I could point to it, but I haven't got a pointer. Uh, there is a little teeny light that was moving. Flare operator didn't see it. He's still looking back where they disappeared. But now he's gonna pick up the lights again. There they are. There's still one ahead of the two bright ones. And now he's picked up one of the dimmer ones that is behind the two bright ones. This is a narrow, doubly narrow field of view. Notice that the, shape, the image of that is out of focus. Now it's getting into better focus. He has manual focus, focal control on the camera, but it never really gets what looks to me like what would look to me like a hard focus. You see going behind the clouds other lights. Remember, the really black areas are where the sun is not shining on the cloud. White areas are where the sun is shining. The atmosphere itself has a sort of a neutral gray color. Uh, halfway between the right. Okay, here's where you convert into the triplets. Right, it's split into two. The, uh, the third one on the triplet is split into two. Now it's going to come out as one here. You can see them all. The leader, the first triplet, the second triplet. It's the left-hand light of the first triplet that splits up into two. It's already split once, and now they reunited, and now it's going to split again. And this is when the uh, FLIR operator was counting, and he gets up to 11 lights. Notice how that splitting is taking place. That's the last view of those lights. At this point, the ground radar is picking up something at one o'clock position ahead of the aircraft. Hmm? That's right. They're looking in the wrong direction anyway. 
He's still looking behind into the left. And now here's the next section of supposedly unknown lights. It's a very bright thing. It's got an irregular shape. And to the right of it and above are two lights. Yeah, <laughs> It's extremely bright, whatever it is, you get this uh, halo effect. There seems to be something that could be ground moving around there in the background. Uh, it's hard to say. Uh, elevation is uh, zero or negative. Could be lights on the ground. Now he's looking at a light, which is the left-hand side, and the flashing that you see on the left-hand side is the propeller, it's a left-hand propeller. He's apparently looking up in the sky, uh, or approximately level, because you're now seeing the bottoms of the clouds. You have to watch very carefully, but as time goes on, a cloud will move in from the right-hand side, will move in the peak of the cloud. Okay. Uh, goes uh, in front of this light that he's tracking. How many people see a purplish color as they look at that? Okay, there's a cloud moving in from the right, and the very peak of that cloud momentarily blocks the, uh, the light. Right there, it's gone and back again. That cloud is about 4, 15 miles away. Well, this time they're getting pretty close to that radar target in front, but the FLIR is, not, is now not seeing anything. You'll see them lock in on some bright cloud tops occasionally. Well, and this is where he swings the FLIR around to look to the right-hand side, and he looks back to the left, and look, well, what's that? 
That's La Luna. Oh, eso no es. Esa es La Luna, ¿no? ¿Está La Luna adelante? Ahí está. Sí. Sí. Ok, es La Luna. A ver, no esperamos, por ejemplo, La Luna. Bueno. Well, if you look real carefully, if you had a ch chance to stop and do go frame by frame, the moon was 1.3 degrees above the uh, above horizontal at that point. And the clear reading was minus one degree. The implication is you had to add 2.3 degrees to any flare elevation reading that was in the forward direction. But in the backward direction, you had to add, uh, same, you had to subtract 2.3 degrees. He's looking for that light that was on the left-hand side again and not finding it. What? Zero level should you would expect zero level to be around the same level as the plane. But I've been told that the plane flies tilted upwards a couple of degrees. <laughs> Those are either bright cloud tops or lights that are on the ground shining up through the up through the cloud. You notice that there's azimuth down below the directly at the bottom, middle bottom is minus 169.8. Uh, 170 degree azimuth is uh, almost directly behind the airplane. This is one of the uh, images that was featured in the initial press release because it's got a tracking gate, a box around it. But except for the fact that it's almost directly behind the aircraft, we don't know much about it. It says zero degrees. Or, no. Seven degrees, as, uh, 173.6 or something, uh, one degree elevation. But since it's behind the airplane, one degree elevation could still be looking downwards. Here to be some other things down there, too. It's hard to tell if you're looking downwards through clouds of the ground or what exactly. If you look here, if you look, you'll notice the, the dim background of the system seems to be moving right along with whatever that light is. In other words, the whole, the whole picture moves at the same time, implying that that light is fixed with whatever the background is. Fixed with respect to whatever the background is. Okay, that's the end of it. Okay, that's the easy part. <laughs> I get my computer cranked back up here. <clears throat> Computer's seen this so many times it turned itself off and went to sleep. <laughs> Wake up call. Okay, could I have the, uh, the um, com computer video again? Thanks. Well, we uh, got an image of the moon, which is very fortuitous. 
because it's the only thing we're absolutely sure of, we know where it was. <laughs> All you have to do is ask the U.S. Navy. Go to AA dot, uh, what is it, Navy, uh, USNO dot Navy, uh, I think it is, or something like that, and you can find uh, calculations for any place on the Earth, any time, where is the sun and the moon and various other things. This is uh, the Navy's uh, uh, astronomical calculation website. 171924, the FLIR was directed towards the moon, was heading, was planking at the moon using the medium field of view and the image centered. The azimuth numbers read 7.4 degrees to the left and the elevation reads one degree down, minus one degree is what it read. So the actual moon direction was azimuth 75.1, elevation 1.3 up above horizontal. The airplane track, if you plot the track of the aircraft, then I assume that the airplane was pointing towards along the track. Now, if there was a side wind, it would have been tilted a little, twi twisted a little bit with respect to that. But anyway, the airplane track is 82 degrees. If you subtract the air, take the airplane track and subtract the actual moon azimuth, you get seven degrees, the difference between straight ahead in the aircraft and where the moon is, and that's pretty close to the 7.4. That's uh, comparing this number right here, seven, with a 7.4 there, so it looks like maybe the azimuth was pretty close, but like I said, we don't know what about the crabbing angle of the aircraft, I'll tell you that, talk about that. Then the elevation, um, the elevation error is 2.3 degrees down. In other words, the elevation read minus one degree, but it should have been reading 2.3, so it was reading 2.3, it should have been reading 1.3, so it was reading 2.3 degrees too low. This means at the forward directions you have to add 2.3 degrees. Uh, this talks about the, the, the tilt of the aircraft. I was told that they don't fly these aircraft horizontally. They fly them tilted upwards a little bit. And uh, the elevation equals zero corresponds to horizontal when there's no tilt in the airplane. So, you know, when you put this device on the aircraft, uh, sitting on the ground, the, air, the, the fuselage is basically horizontal. Of course, Within a couple of degree error, nobody really cares, I suppose, what horizontal is for their point of view. So um, there could be an error in mounting the uh, FLIR on there and getting it exactly horizontal. But in any case, if the plane tilts upwards, then horizontal reads a negative number. Zero degrees on the FLIR is now reading this way if you got a tilt. Zero degrees on the FLIR is here. Anything down here at like horizontal is going to be a negative number. If uh, the FLIR was off by 2.3 degrees, then any number in the forward direction, um, you had to subtract 2. Point, well, it was reading, uh, uh, no, I was trying to say, this is zero here, it's reading low by 2.3 degrees. In the backwards direction, it's reading high by 2.3 degrees. And at intermediate angles, like left and right, it's reading correctly. So there's an, an equation that you use to calculate the actual elevation angle. Now there is a possible distance estimates. In a couple of instances when the plane flies in a straight line, it's possible to estimate distance by triangulation using the change in azimuth as the plane flies along. But this assumes that the crabbing angle or yaw of the plane is the same at the beginning and the end of the airplane track segment. And that relates to the situation when there's a crosswind. If there's a crosswind and the plane wants to maintain on a particular course or track, it has to turn into the wind somewhat. Well now, if the azimuth is measured with respect to straight ahead, the azimuth on the FLIR is measured with respect to straight ahead, then you would have to compensate for the crabbing angle to get the azimuth with respect to north-south on the Earth. And if the, if the crabbing angle changes, if you make one measurement, let's say over here with crabbing angle zero, you measure an azimuth with respect to the aircraft of some number, and then over here, the crabbing angle is different because the wind is a little bit different, um, and you, you measure an azimuth angle, then you can come up with a triangulation, but it will be an incorrect number because you didn't account for the, the, the uh, twist of the aircraft. And so that's an uncertainty that I can't account for. Here is a second-by-second second plot of the azimuth of that first little light that he tracked. Remember the one that he tracked for a period of time, it was just a little light and it was going in and out behind clouds and finally disappeared. So it takes some time obviously to read these numbers off the, uh, uh, off the uh, video, 
and then plot the whole thing. But I had uh, observed as you draw a line from the first azimuth, the azimuth of the first location to the second. This corresponds to a distance that the airplane flew. Here is time. The plane is flying at 3.8 miles per minute. Uh, so it flies a certain distance in 2.47 minutes. If you make a triangle out of this with the, using the azimuth angle I call beta here as the azimuth right there, 132 point something or other, and angle gamma of azimuth over here, which is this angle, then you get a triangle out of this where the distance, this is the distance of the airplane traveled, about nine miles. And then you can calculate um, this R0 distance for, two, say, is 215 miles. If the, these numbers are correct, the, the, the mathematics is correct. The question is, is this exactly the 130 something or other degrees? Is this exactly 130 something or other degrees? And I can't be absolutely sure because the plane crabbing angle could change. But if this is 215 or over 200 miles, it's very interesting. It, this says that the object was stationary. This says if the object was stationary and the plane flew past it like that, if the object was stationary, then it had to be that far away and the horizon is only 135 miles. So it was over the horizon, but you couldn't see something over the horizon. Therefore, it would have to be up above the horizon some distance if it were this far away and stationary. Or you could have a situation where an object is closer to the airplane. The airplane's flying along here. But in that situation, if it's not this far away, then it has to be moving. So this could be evidence of something that was moving along with the aircraft. It's not rejected that that's a possibility. It does not appear to be something that was stationary on the ground because it would be too far away. In order to check this problem of crabbing angle, we can at the very least look at the track of the aircraft itself during the period of time. Uh, the longitude changes by a certain number of degrees. Notice this number, these numbers are going down to the right. That's because longitude numbers in Mexico, for example, start at uh, 90 or 89 degrees, and they move, they increase. Longitude increases as you go to the west. So this is traveling towards the east. At the same time, the uh, airplane was traveling a little bit northward, so the latitude is increasing. Therefore, these lines represent the actual track of the air aircraft as you plotted it on the surface of the Earth. And you can see that the uh, data points here uh, do not lie in a perfect line, but on the average, it lies in a line like that. Uh, 6.8 degrees north of east, or azimuth heading of 83.2 degrees during this particular time right here. The point is that the airplane definitely was flying on a roughly straight angle, well, straight track. The GPS readout numbers in the lower left-hand corner, the latitude and longitude, do not tell you, unfortunately, if the airplane was undergoing a crabbing angle effect because of crosswind. Here is a, uh, another graph of that same, the same data, the azimuth plotted as a function of time, and this wobbling, um, this is the center of the field of view, which is pretty close in most of the time to uh, the um, direction to the object. This wobbling could be a result of uh, the aircraft crabbing angle changing somewhat. Um, and here I would put in uh, lines that correspond to this very faint one here, this blue one. If an object was 200 miles away, you would pretty well agree with the data. If it was at horizon distance, 135 miles a day, you lie pretty much outside the data. If it were only 50 miles away, you'll lie a long ways out of the data. That, that, now, these are assumptions that the object is stationary on the Earth or stationary with respect to the Earth and the plane's flying past it. If you allow that the object moves, then these calculations don't mean anything. You can't tell how far away it was if you assume it was moving. It's just farther than the clouds, and you can try to make a calculation of cloud distances, which I have done. Here's a track showing the twins, and I attempt to measure the... Uh, the distance to the twins if they were a stationary lights on the ground. And um, I have data in narrow and medium and very, and very narrow field of view that I'm using. And up in here in particular are the data that count the most because the, they're closest to pointing directly towards the object. I didn't calculate the actual azimuth of the object at each point, but this is the center of the field of view. Uh, the, uh, and the center of the field of view is only, the, it's the field of view is only four-tenths of a degree wide, so. 
Anyway, during this period of time, the plane traveled 6.7 miles. You come up with R0 being about the distance to the horizon. So if the twins, those extremely bright lights, were, at the, were stationary, it would appear that they were about at the horizon. Again, this makes the assumption that at the very beginning of this timing and at the very end, the plane crabbing angle is the same. And I have no way of knowing that. But assuming that the plane crabbing angle is the same, these very extremely bright lights, if they were stationary on the ground, were 134 miles away. Well, uh, explanations, just as in the New Zealand case, when an explanation started coming out of the woodwork, here you have explanations coming out of the woodwork. The Mexican scientists were quick to suggest a form of ball lightning or low temperature plasma. Um, then other people suggested balloons or balloons carrying heat sources. The US stealth aircraft or some other um, uh, secret US aircraft was suggested. Reflections of sunlight from ground level, fires in the oil field, and last night we heard about the possibility of uh, UV radiating spaceships actually heating the air around them and um, creating light, uh, infrared light. Um, you saw in the video what bright light reflections look like, round dots of various size. There's no features to that. It's a small object, of evidently a small source that is not resolved. Resolved means that you can see some actual shape, like, for example, the streets in here are barely resolved. You can't resolve the individual street. The size of this image is larger than the width of the street it represents, but the spacing between the streets is resolved. The spacing between this extremely bright light and this location here is resolved. You can see a difference between them, but if there is some structure to this thing, we can't tell. It's unresolvable. Now there's a question of if the lights were at a big distance, or, or why could it be that the FLIR could be picking up light, um, picking up radiation that the human eye can't see? And this could be the distance effect. If these light sources are a long ways away, the light has to travel through the atmosphere. It turns out that the atmosphere scatters visible light more than it scatters infrared. People use infrared photography take infrared film and photograph things, uh, scenery and infrared, and they find that they can sort of cut through the haze that way. Well, that's the situation here. If these lights are long distance away, the visible part of the light gets so reduced by scattering out of the pathway of the light that uh, the visible light gets hidden, you might say, but the infrared light travels through a lot better, and so the FLIR can pick up the infrared light and you can't see what's going on. So this can, I guess can be an explanation that the objects are many tens of miles away. Well, now the oil field explanation has been proposed. Why in the world would anybody do that? The answer is, here's this Carmen City right here, right in there. And just offshore from Carmen City are a bunch of uh, oil platforms. And these oil platforms very often have uh, fires burning off uh, extra gas that comes out of the ground. So we look back at this map. Here is a, comp a compound map made by one of the people that has been communicating with me where he took um, uh, sur uh, satellite photographs that show where these oil fields are, are by the heat they generate. And here's the track of the aircraft. Now look at this next chart. Another, the guy in France sent me this where he had taken all the azimuth numbers that I gave and the straight plane track um, and plotted them with respect to uh, where this oil field was. And you can see that they're looking in the direction of the oil field. The line length is listed as 100 nautical miles, uh, about 115 statute miles. So these distances are sizable, 100 miles away. In the, uh, the situation where you were looking, remember when we were looking through the propeller, that one little tiny light, and we were look, trying to see it through the propeller rotation. That's this situation here, looking at 90 degrees with respect to the airplane. And uh, the possibility that there was some light source up near uh, this city of Campeche. So what about the oil field fires as a possible explanation? <clears throat> um, the um, Mexican DOD has responded no, they were a great distance, uh, and the uh, target appears to have been above ground level. Um, 
But so there's a maybe stuck after the no, maybe no. <laughs> because remember the, the angle elevation, the elevation angle on the aircraft, the actual elevation depends upon the tilting angle of the aircraft, and we can't be sure of exactly what that was at the time. Okay, no, an, an argument for not being the oil fields. An argument for being, for being the oil field. They were, looking east, they were looking toward the oil field as they flew eastward, and there's no doubt that they were looking generally in that direction. Here's another counter argument. They were also looking toward the oil field as they flew northwest, but didn't see any oil field lights. So let's go back here. As they were flying in this direction, just before they got the FLIR light, the unknown light on the FLIR, they, uh, it seems to me that they were looking at this little peninsula right here. But the point is that they were looking in the direction of these lights, of these fires, and uh, they didn't see anything. So why would they not see them here? And then suddenly when they turn the corner, as it were, they see them from here. Um, so there isn't any conclusion as of yet. <clears throat> Uh, the first radar target appears to have been unusual. It had a sizable radar cross-section because it was able to be detected out to about 40 miles distance. Um, anything with a sizable radar cross-section uh, should be visible at about two miles. So I would expect that uh, they would have been able to see it if it was a plane or almost anything that, that, that the radar could detect. <clears throat> and it did make some sort of a definite track, so this is not a situation of a weather target from the radar. Uh, radar angels or whatever. As far as the FLIR is concerned, well, maybe. I don't know. We uh, can't conclude positively whether any of those radar FLIR images is identifiable or not as of yet. This is unlike this in the New Zealand case. <clears throat> now, there may be a positive conclusion later on. In the New Zealand case, we're lucky that uh, conclusion, a positive conclusion was possible based on uh, radar, combining radar, verbal testimony, color movie film, and so on. You put the whole thing together, you can end up with the lights that were seen and, and filmed in that case um, couldn't be identified. Here we don't know. I need more translation and information before I can do anything further. So uh, that basically ends it. Uh, if there are any questions, I guess the, uh, the marathon session will come to a close. <laughs> I have not been told about anything having to do with ground radar, and I don't think there was any ground radar. Uh, I'm not saying that they didn't have it, but I, that nobody has said anything about it. So if, you, but if, if it was tracked by ground radar, then you'd be able to translate between the ground radar and the radar of the plane within our distance? Oh, yeah. Well, if it were tracked by ground radar, you would presumably know the distance and direction anyway. anyway. Uh, about the only input from the ground so far that I'm aware of has been that there weren't any other aircraft at, in the airspace at the time. <clears throat>